But let's uh, bring in a very special guest joining me now in East Islip, New York, is the attorney representing the Laundry family, Stephen Bertolino, is with us. Stephen, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We really do appreciate it. I know a lot of people um, want to talk to you, and, and we appreciate your time tonight. Um, yes, good evening, Vinny. Thanks for having me. Can I start here? And I want to clarify this for myself and obviously for everyone watching. Um, I always introduced or spoke about you as a Laundry family attorney. Did, do you represent, did you, or did you represent Brian? Do you represent uh, Chris and Roberta, the parents? Did you represent all of them, just some of them? Can, can you clarify that for us? Yes, well, I've spoken on this topic a couple of times and, you know, throughout the course of the ordeal back in September and October, I did represent all three parties and in different capacities. Uh, as of now, I am uh, representing Chris and Roberta. Okay, so at the time, you you represented all three. Did you did you have contact with all three? Um, Brian, I and, did, and, and and Roberta and Chris. I had spoken to Roberta and Chris. I had spoken to Brian. I spoke to them separately, and I spoke to them together. Okay, I want to get to today's hearing because one of the big issues that was brought up today was a statement uh, which you released. September 14th of 2021. I'm going to put it up on the screen uh, so our viewers can see and and uh, everyone can understand what we're talking about here. And it says this is this is a statement from counsel for the laundry family. This is understandably an extremely difficult time for both the Petito family and the laundry family. It is our understanding that a search has been organized for Miss Petito in or near Grand Teton National Park in Wyoming. On behalf of the Laundry family, it is our hope that the search for Miss Petito is successful and that Miss Petito is reunited with her family. On the advice of counsel, the Laundry family is remaining in the background at this juncture and will have no further comment. Um, and, and here is one of the issues that was brought up in court today uh, from the Petito uh, family side is that from this note, especially the lines it is our hope that the search for Miss Petito is successful and that Miss Petito is reunited with her family, that he gave them false hope, misled them that Gabby perhaps was alive and would be found and would be reunited with the family. Um, was this misleading, this, this note? I don't believe the note was misleading at all. I think the, the note was a generic uh, I should say the statement. The statement was a generic statement uh, put out. Um, if you recall, the uh, presence of the press was bountiful, to say the least. And everybody was clamoring for some statement or some comment coming from the laundry side. Um, you know, we, we only know certain things at the time that they're told to us. Uh, just as you heard uh, Mr. Riley say today, that he doesn't have all the information from the FBI. Um, I did not have all the available information on uh, the date that that uh, statement was released. Chris and Roberta, you know, had uh, probably less information than I had. And when all said and done, if you take that statement standing alone, um, it is not an outrageous statement. It's not uh, an, an intentionally harmful statement in any way. Uh, and I think it's a generic statement that just about any defense lawyer would put out when pressed for a comment as to the um, investigation that was going on at the time. I guess the, the real issue associated with this is the timing, September 14th. Uh, Brian had returned in the beginning of September, wasn't it? Like September 1st or so when he got back to Florida uh, about that time. And, and I guess the indication is, is that at that point, I mean, he knows that Gabby's not alive. So is, is what you're saying here tonight that you wrote this statement and based on the information you had, that you, you, you didn't have the information about where Gabby was or what happened at that point? Well, what I'm saying is at the time that statement was put out, it was very early in, uh, in the episode or the the saga, if you will. Uh, the information that I had uh, was certainly privileged. Uh, the information that I could share with the, the public and the press uh, was put forth in that statement uh, as to what we knew, uh, that there was an investigation going on. 
And, you know, let's cut to what happened today. I mean, th this statement obviously became the crux of uh, the proceeding. And in the end, if you think about what Mr. Riley was discussing, he struggled, in his words, to find some basis upon which to file this lawsuit. And he struggled to find some duty that the laundries may or may not have had to divulge or speak or say anything. And he couldn't. He couldn't find any such duty. He couldn't put forth to the court any such duty. So the only thing that the Petito family have uh, has, and the only thing that Mr. Riley has in connection with this lawsuit to stand on would be this statement that I put out, which standing alone and reading it uh, you know, on the words that are written on paper is not atrocious. It's not utterly intolerable. It's certainly not outrageous. It's certainly not mean-spirited in any way. And again, I represented clients for many, many years. Sometimes they tell me the truth. Sometimes they don't tell me the truth. And in the end, my firsthand knowledge is my firsthand knowledge. What I can put out there is based upon my firsthand knowledge. And that was that there was an investigation being conducted. And it was my hope uh, that the Petitos uh, would be relocated, I'm sorry, would be reunited with their daughter. Now, and I guess that the problem they have is that it seems, is it you speaking or is it the laundry family speaking, right? There's always a little bit of gray area when it comes to lawyers. You know, they used to call us, I'm a lawyer too, mouthpieces, right? That we speak, uh, like our clients speak through us. Um, and the, the Johnny Depp trial was actually mentioned today. The, the one count that Johnny Depp lost was a statement made by his attorney on his behalf that the jury and the judge and everyone agreed could be attributed to Johnny Depp. So from this perspective, are you saying this statement should only be attributed to you and not to uh, your clients? Well, Vinny, I heard that part of the, uh, the judge's comments as well. And, you know, the law is the law. So, you know, we're bound by that. And the law in Florida is such that, uh, as you point out with the uh, Johnny Depp case, uh, the client is bound by what their agents, in this case, the attorney, uh, says on their behalf. And my statement clearly says on behalf of the laundry family, uh, this is what, you know, we're putting forth. Um, so with that in mind, knowing that we're bound by the statement, we can't change the statement. Um, I can't you know, sit here tonight and tell you that it's not the laundry statement, that it was mine. Uh, what I can tell, under the law that is, what I can tell you is that I prepared the statement. Chris and Roberta did not. I put the statement out there. It is my statement, um, but I'm not going to say that the judge is wrong under the law, that it should be applied to the laundry family. But let's move to the point at hand. If you're going to say that this statement, or more precisely, if Mr. Riley and the Petitos are going to say that this statement is the basis of an intentional infliction of emotional distress claim, then let's look at the elements of that claim and come right to the outrageousness of it. You, you've had that statement on the screen several times. I've read it many, many times. That's not an outrageous statement. It's not utterly intolerable in a civilized community. And in fact, I think it's the type of statement that just about any defense attorney would put out when they are you know, pressed for a comment from the press. Certainly we could say no comment uh, all the time, um, but you know, a, a softer approach rather than no comment uh, is to say, hey, look, you know, we understand what's going on. We, we understand you're going through a difficult time. We're going through a difficult time here. At, at the moment that uh, statement was released, uh, Brian had uh, left the home uh, in a distraught manner, as I had put out once before, and his parents were concerned about him. So in the, in the context of the, of the face of the statement, it's not outrageous. So if that's the only thing that, the, that Mr. Riley and the Petitos are using to form the basis of this lawsuit, I think it fails. Of course, you know, we respect the judge. He asked a lot of good deliberate questions of both sides today, uh, which was, you know, comforting uh, sitting in my chair. Uh, he certainly asked Matt Luca uh, several questions, certainly asked Mr. Riley several questions pertaining to that. 
And I think he was fair in his questioning uh, to the extent that I think the judge, you know, really is in tune with, um, you know, the point of whether or not uh, this statement would be outrageous. And I think he was quite clear that he believes under Florida law, the statement should be attributed to Chris and Roberta Laundry. And if that's so, let's move to the next step. Even if that statement is attributed to Chris and Roberta and or myself, is it outrageous standing alone? Great analysis. I, I get it. I, I think where the discrepancy here is, is if you know she's dead and you're, you're saying um, it is our hope that it's a successful search and she's reunited, it's giving them false hope to a family that is distraught. And I think that's the argument for the outrageousness. I understand you completely disagree with that, but I just wanted um, the folks at home to understand both sides of this. Stephen Bertolino, the family attorney for the Laundries, uh, Brian Laundry's parents, uh, staying with us. I have a whole bunch more questions for you, Stephen. I appreciate your time tonight. Also, coming up in the next hour. Big breaking news in Cobb County, Georgia tonight. Ross Harris was convicted of intentionally leaving his 22-month-old son Cooper in a hot car to die back in 2014 so he could live a child-free life. Now, the Georgia Supreme Court has overturned his conviction, and tonight we have the latest in this shocking decision. They tried to make it look like he was sexting on his phone knowing his child was in the car. And that's not true. The, the, he, he was sexting on the phone, there's no doubt about that. But they never did prove that he knew the child was in the car. Cheers. All right, what I need from everybody here is help. Because the, the goal is still not met. And that goal is to bring Gabby home safe. All right? And uh, I'm asking for help from everyone here. I'm asking for help everyone at home. I'm asking for help from the parents of, uh, of Brian. And I'm asking for help of the family members and friends of the Laundry family as well. That was Joe Petito asking for help. Um, early on in this search for his daughter, Gabby, at, at a press conference. Now, Gabby's stepfather, Joe Schmidt, a little bit later on, was out in Wyoming during the search. I had an opportunity to speak to him when he was out there. Take a listen. We have had no communication between our family and theirs. Uh, it's absolutely absurd. We have, we don't understand why. They were traveling together. At some point, you left there. We know you've been home since September 1st. You know something. And the fact that you're hiding behind your attorney, which we understand your constitutional rights not to speak, but, that, but it doesn't make any sense to us, none whatsoever. And the attorney uh, for the Laundry family, now the attorney for uh, Brian's parents, uh, Stephen Bertolino, uh, still with us. Uh, again, appreciate your time tonight, Stephen. Um, it was painful for all those parents. I mean, for the, the, the stepdad, dad, mom, stepmom, they all heartbroken in this search. And that, that silence that they were getting, the lack of any, any sort of information to them was very puzzling. Um, Stephen, why? why? Why not let them know something? Well, if you go back in time, I've said it numerous times, Chris and Roberta remained silent at my direction. I think I said that as early as September 13th, uh, which was Monday. And I continued to say that throughout the process. Um, you know, sticking to the, the issue at hand today in the court proceeding, you know, this was only about a motion to dismiss. And during that, the, the motion and what the court has to evaluate is taking all of the allegations within the complaint as true. So you can say, why were we silent? Uh, for today's purposes, it didn't really matter. Everything that the petitos are alleging um, is deemed as true, even though we've denied them. And what it comes down to 
uh, the question of whether or not we can remain silent, uh, I just heard Mr. Schmidt say, we understand their constitutional right to remain silent, but we don't understand why they're not communicating. If he truly understood the, the constitutional right to remain silent, as was brought up in the court proceeding today, that right doesn't start when a criminal investigation commences. That right starts all the time. I mean, no other way to put that. It never ends, I should say. It's a continuum. And you don't wait for the police to say, oh, by the way, I just opened a file and it's got your name on it. When there's an occurrence of an event, the police may investigate or family members may investigate and they come looking for information. The right to remain silent exists at that time. And that was one of the issues that was brought up today. Um, and there was some back and forth in the courtroom. But I, I think the law is clear that there doesn't have to be a criminal investigation for parties, whether it was Brian, whether it was Christopher or Roberta Laundry, they had the right not to speak. And I advised them of those, those rights. And I told them to exercise those rights throughout uh, the September and October months. And continuing to this day, I've told them to do that. Um, so why not speak? If you're a lawyer, Vinny, and you've practiced any criminal law at all, I don't think you've ever advised your client to speak unless they're ready to take a plea bargain. Yeah, and well, I was a prosecutor, so I want them to speak all the time, <laughs> Stephen. You know that. Yeah, um, so if but you're looking here's for my question. Here's my question, if, if though. If you're looking for an allocution, you want them to talk. Right. But if you're on the other, if you're other, on the other side of the rail, you know as well as I do. You keep your mouth shut. You don't say a word. How about this? This case, say it survives the motion. This civil case continues. It's time for depositions. Is Chris? Is Roberta going to speak when they're asked questions during a deposition? Well, as you know, the, the right against self-incrimination is going to follow him throughout the civil trial. And the judge pointed that out as well. Um, you know, if the, the procedure has to be that uh, they invoke the, uh, the right against self-incrimination to each and every question, they very well may do that. But we're not focusing on that. I mean, we're certainly prepared. Uh, if this motion does not go our way, uh, we will take the next legal steps that we need to do to protect the Chris and Roberta laundry. Um, but in the end, um, the Petitos have the right as well to, to take all necessary procedural steps uh, to see that, that what they want done is done within the courts. And we're just doing the same thing on the opposite side. Let me ask you this, because this is what everyone's thinking at home right now. Um, Brian Laundry's dead. Everyone believes he's the one, absolutely, that murdered Gabby Petito. Chris and Roberta didn't do anything. If, if you're taking the fifth, and this is, this is a conversation we have a lot here on Court TV, someone taking the fifth, and then what are we supposed to take away from that? What is the, the, the public supposed to take away from that? I know it can't be used against you, but... What do you think the public should take away from the fact that they're exercising their fit? We know they didn't kill Gabby. So when you use the, the pronoun, you know, we know they, uh, you, you're saying Chris and Roberta, correct? Correct. We, we know that okay. Chris and Roberta had nothing so, to do with the death of Gabby Petito. So what's, what's, the, what's the concern that they may incriminate themselves about what? So again, dealing with what was on the table today in court, we're dealing with within the four corners of the complaint on each page and the allegations that were set forth. And there was some uh, back and forth uh, between the judge and uh, Judge Carroll and Mr. Riley uh, with respect to whether or not there was some allegation of, of criminal uh, activity. And, you know, Mr. Riley you know, tried to say that, that there wasn't. But meanwhile, he says that uh, Chris and Roberta had assisted Brian in trying to escape. And, you know, that clearly doesn't make sense. If you go back in time, as you just said a few moments ago, uh, everyone believes that uh, Brian came home on the first. And if that's truly the date and uh, the police came knocking on the door on the 11th, um, that's 10 days. So if Brian was, was home for 10 days and they went camping and they did all these other things, 
where is the criminality in that? Uh, there is none. Um, however, the criminal investigation that the FBI conducted during uh, you know, the course of uh, September uh, certainly included Chris and Roberta, and I know that for a fact. Uh, that's not something that's within the four corners of the complaint. Um, but I had multiple conversations with the FBI with respect to uh, potential charges um, against Chris and Roberta. Uh, they didn't go very far. And in the end, there was a lot of speculation that Chris and Roberta were, were helping uh, Brian. In fact, many of the news outlets were, were putting on uh, pundits who were, you know, speculating as to burner phones and, you know, Appalachian trails and things of that nature. So when you have clients that are under that kind of scrutiny and that kind of pressure, you want them to come forward and speak or you want them to sit silent and not take the risk that something they say is going to be turned and used against them. And as a prosecutor, you know, the defense attorneys are always going to advise their clients not to say a word. And that's what I told them to do. And that's why they invoked their Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination. All right, Steve Bertolino, Laundry Family Attorney, staying with us. Uh, you're in lockdown tonight with us, Steve, and we're not letting you go. <laughs> have a few more that's questions for Yeah, we have a few more questions for We're going to go through a little bit of the timeline of this case. Uh, we'll be right back. As you're aware, the FBI and the Northport Police Department and our state and local law enforcement partners have been searching the area of the Carlton Reserve for Brian Laundrie, a person of interest in the murder of Gabby Petito. Earlier today, investigators found what appears to be human remains, along with personal items, such as a backpack and notebook belonging to Brian Laundrie. These items were found in an area that up until recently have been underwater. Our evidence response team is on scene using all available forensic resources to process the area. It's likely the team will be on scene for several days. I know you have a lot of questions, but we don't have all the answers yet. Pray with worthy .com. was here at the vast Carlton Reserve, not far from this entrance where authorities located the remains of 23-year-old Brian Laundrie. This after weeks of search crews wading through flooded trails and swamps. Located near those remains, the authorities also uncovered a notebook, a revolver, a backpack belonging to Brian Laundrie. This notebook also contained a suicide note where Laundrie confessed to killing Gabby Petito. Okay, we have a few more questions that I need to ask Stephen Bertolino. He is the attorney, family law, the family attorney for the Laundry family. Um, Stephen, do you see any scenario where your clients, the Laundries, could sit down with Gabby's parents and and answer questions with or without lawyers, perhaps as a way, uh, 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 you know? A strange way maybe to settle this lawsuit and just you know parent to parent have that conversation and and share some information do you see that potentially happening under any scenario you know it's funny Vinny, that you asked me that question because you know when brian's remains were first um uh, discovered found uh i kind of posited something like that uh, when somebody asked me a question, I said, yeah, I don't know where this goes. There may be a, a point in time uh, when there could be conversations, and that was the word I used, uh, between the families. Um, I'm never going to say never because I don't know where it'll go. I can tell you that, you know, Chris and Roberta have lost a child. Uh, they've lost their son. Uh, many people ask me how they're doing. Uh, people have just recently starting to recognize that, you know, Chris and Roberta really um, had no, you know, n nothing to do with uh, G Gabrielle Petito's uh, uh, murder, and yet they are, you know, suffering just as as badly as the, the Petito family. Um, that being said, um, there's certainly no olive branch being reached across the aisle uh, when the only um, communication was filing of several lawsuits against the laundries. Had one of the attorneys for the Petito family reached out to me, 
um, as collegial as they should instead of doing it by Twitter or a, an open letter to the public. Uh, you know, perhaps we could have resolved some certain issues many, many months ago, uh, but that's not the path that the Petito family has chosen. Uh, so we'll walk down the path with them that they've chosen to walk down. And if they choose uh, something different, then one of their attorneys will have to reach out to me. Do you know what's in that notebook? Have you read it? Ha has, have his parents read that notebook? I can tell you that uh, the parents had been shown some excerpts uh, in the notebook, but uh, they were very uh, upset and distraught at the time. And I've spoken to Chris and Roberta, and there's uh, a vague recollection of some of the writings that were in there. Uh, I personally have not seen the notebook. I've been advised um, from certain parties as to the contents of, of certain uh, things that are in there. Um, and, you know, we'll have to wait and see uh, what gets disclosed from that notebook in, in due time. I wanted to go to one of the dates on the, on the timeline from the lawsuit that was filed uh, by Gabby's parents. Uh, and, and in particular, August 28th of 2021, it is believed Brian Laundrie advised his parents that he had murdered Gabby Petito on the same day Christopher and Roberta spoke with attorney Bertolino. Um, are you guys disputing that? Again, uh, with the motion that we filed, uh, we are kind of bound that everything the Petitos allege is deemed as true. So in the context of the motion to dismiss, uh, we have to go under the guise that everything is true, although we dispute it. Uh, with respect to that specific statement, um, yes, we're disputing that. The allegations in the complaint you know, include that. We've addressed it accordingly, and if and when this lawsuit proceeds, uh, we'll have to address, I presume, those questions, uh, or Chris and Roberta may be faced with those questions if it goes to the deposition stage. All right, Stephen, I want you to, to stay with us. One more segment. Long night for Stephen Bertolino, but he's been very kind to us. And, and again, we do appreciate it because I have some um, other questions about the, the, the public reaction and everything else that your clients um, have dealt with and will continue to deal with um, in the days to come. Uh, also, folks, coming up in the next hour. On the docket tonight in Los Angeles, California, the murder of hip-hop legend Nipsey Hussle. On March 31st, 2019, Eric Ronald Holder Jr. shot and killed Nipsey Hussle. But he was shot from literally from, from the bottom of his feet to the top of his head. Find yours at Nix.com. This is the home of Chris and Roberta Laundrie, where Gabby Petito and her fiance Brian Laundrie lived before their cross country van life trip. Now, if you remember, in September of 2021, for weeks, media staked out this property, protesters staked out this property, demanding that the Laundries speak out what happened to Gabby Petito, what happened when their son Brian Laundrie went missing, but they never would speak publicly, only through their attorney. Let's take a look at, at, at some of what Chanley was describing there. It wasn't that long ago. You've got uh, folks protesting outside of the laundry household. And the attorney for the laundry, Stephen Bertolino, is still with us here tonight. Um, Stephen, your thoughts about and, and you know, there's a couple things going on, right? There's the, the lawsuit now that your clients are dealing with, the civil lawsuit, but then there's also like real life and the rest of their lives. So um, what are your thoughts tonight about the way uh, Chris and Roberta have been treated by folks like me and the media um, and the public in, in general and how has it impacted their lives? You know, I'm starting to laugh because uh, I think they were treated horribly by the media. Uh, I think the media needs to check itself. Um, I can tell you that I had several words with some producers for the media when they wanted me on their shows, and I challenged those producers to put me on some very popular shows uh, at their request. 
uh, only under certain conditions so that I could confront the pundits and the so-called legal experts who were um, broadcasting rubbish and garbage uh, about, you know, putting Brian on planes and buses and uh, burner phones and things of that nature, uh, all speculation. And I understand that, you know, the media needs to fill the time in their 24-hour news cycle, um, but they went from reporting the news to making up the news. And it was, it was just horrible. With respect to the public, um, certainly the public has a right to intervene and, and protest, uh, but I don't think it's, it's acceptable uh, in our society, our civilized society, to have people protesting uh, outside of anyone's home. Um, there are you know, calmer and, and better ways to do it. Uh, and the fact that they have the right to do that on a public street is, is a great part of America and a great part of American life. But it comes to a point where uh, we were really fearful for Chris and Roberta's safety in the house. And at some point, Chris and Roberta thought about leaving and th there really was no place for them to go that, that would have been you know, as safe as their own home. Um, so you can say, well, too bad, you deserved it. I've had people say that you know, to me and you know, I, I don't agree with that. I, I think um, we don't do witch hunts anymore. We don't do public hangings. And that's what this mob did. And the media supported it. And if you go back and you review the tape, you'll see that I'm correct. The media pushed this, um, this public raucous, this circus, as it was described, uh, I think, even earlier by Chanley. Uh, so that's my reaction to it. I, I have no warm and fuzzy feelings for the way the press uh, handled this particular um, saga. We have about uh, 30 seconds or so, Stephen. Um, do you think, though, that if Chris and Roberta did speak publicly and pour their hearts out about their perspective of what happened here, that it could help? In the past or in the present? Going forward. Going forward, it, it, we can't speak, uh, they can't speak, uh, especially with this uh, civil lawsuit going on. Um, you know, will it help what? Will it help heal some wounds? Uh, will it help give some closure? I can certainly tell you there are a, a lot of things that are unknown that, you know, for the time being have to remain unknown. Whether or not they're disclosed in, in the future, uh, that remains to be seen. How they're disclosed in the future remains to be seen. Um, right now, we're focusing on this uh, civil lawsuit. Absolutely. Uh, Stephen, we're, we're, yeah, we're, at, we're out of time, and, and um, I, I just hope everyone noticed how carefully you chose your words because of your ethical obligations. Uh, Stephen Bertolino, appreciate all your time tonight. I hope you'll speak to us again. Vinny, thank you for having me. Have a good evening.